Don't lie. We have the lowest labor participation rate since the 1970s. Almost 95 of our fellow million of our fellow Americans are out of the labor force. America has now had the worst recovery since the 1940s. The country now has the lowest home ownership rate in 51 years. There are now almost 13 million Americans, more Americans on food stamps. We have over 43 million Americans living in poverty. That's 8 million more than when Obama became president. Median household income is now lower than it was in 2007. Today in America, one in five households do not have a single family member that works. One in six American men age 18 to 34, they're either in jail or out of work. And President Obama will be leaving office having accumulated more debt than all 43 presidents before him combined. Now, there has been a 58% increase in the number of African Americans on food stamps. We have seen a 20% jump in the number of African Americans who are no longer in the labor force. Now, the African American home ownership rate, that is also down. It's more than 20% lower than the national average. African American unemployment is 8.1%. The national average is 4.9%. The wage cap between African Americans and white workers is the worst in nearly 40 years. Median household income for African Americans is $20,000 less than the national average. And the African American poverty rate is 24.1%. That is over 10% higher than the national average. Now there's also been a surge in inner city crime in Chicago, for example, President Obama's hometown, over 3,100 people have been shot this year alone. And since Obama has been in office, 3,660 people have been murdered. And according to the Chicago Tribune, historical stats now show that 75% of those victims are African. Well, it's great to see you. How are you? Very good, thank you. Um, you heard all of those statistics. You cite a lot of them in your speeches. Right, I do. Really bad. Bad, very bad. For the African American community, very bad. And honestly, for the community of this country, I mean, we're not doing well. You know that. Our good jobs have been taken away. They've gone to Mexico. They've gone to all over the place, but they haven't come back to us. So we're going to make some very big changes. But disproportionately, black Americans have suffered the most. Totally. Absolutely. It's not even close. That's why I say, you know, like, I can fix it. We're going to fix it. And I always say, what do you have to lose? Some people like that, and some people don't. But it's like, and people are using that statement all over the place now. What do you have to lose? It's so bad. Some of the inner cities are so bad uh, that it's, uh, look, it's a disgrace, frankly, what's happened. When you look at these numbers, a 20% jump in the number of African Americans no longer in the workforce, 58% increase black Americans on food stamps. This right. is only since Obama has been president. Home ownership rate. I, I go through the entire list. You have made it a point in this campaign to go to, specifically, to reach out to black Americans, go to black churches and say, give me a chance. Historically, Republicans haven't done that. Why is this so important? Well, I think maybe I'm a little different than a lot of the Republicans. I think uh, some of the states we're leading, like I see we're doing great in Maine, we're doing great in Connecticut, we're doing great in places that normally a Republican wouldn't do as well. And some of them, I mean, really, they wouldn't do well at all. They haven't won these states in years. Uh, Colorado has been amazing. It's been like incredible what's gone on. Wisconsin, we're doing great. So we, uh, you know, we're doing well in places that a lot of people wouldn't do very well. What are the specific ideas in your economic plan? I know, for example, trade is a big part of it. I know you're going to let multinational corporations bring back trillions of dollars from overseas. You've talked at length about energy independence. How does that help people that are here? people that are in cities like Detroit, cities that are deteriorating. Well, it's about jobs. Look, our jobs have been stripped. You look at Detroit, where I went with, uh, I tell you what, we had, we had such an amazing time with Bishop Jackson. And here we have 
I'll tell you, my pastor, right? What a pastor. Daryl Scott. He is, and he's become a big television star. But he's never going to leave anybody over here. But he's become a big television star. He co-hosts my great. show now every night. Oh, really? So, yeah. Is that right? That's good. But he is a fantastic guy. You have some incredible people. And by the way, they're not allowed really to speak their mind. You know, because if they do, they have the Johnson Amendment to contend with. We're going to terminate that Johnson. These are the people that you want to have speaking for you and freely speaking for you. But we need jobs. We need jobs. Desperately need jobs. Now, obviously, we need the schools. We need the education. We need all sorts of things, and especially the inner cities. The inner cities are, I mean, can you say never, but certainly one of the worst stages ever in the history of the inner city. Uh, it's so unsafe where you walk down the street and you get shot or your child gets shot. So we're going we're gonna to really fix the inner cities. We're going to spend a lot of time. The Democrats have run them for 100 years, mostly uninterrupted. I mean, nobody else. They're just uninterrupted. And you see what's happened. The high you school gradual, graduation rate, 9% lower for African Americans than the national average. High school dropout rate, African Americans, is higher than the national average. Inner city schools seem to be suffering the most. You say, let local communities and states handle education. Well, we're taking away Common Core. Common Core out of Washington is a disaster, right? We're going to knock it out. Boom, boom. And, I mean, look at the people. Look at the way, right? Look at the people, the way they, the mothers and the aunts and the uncles and the fathers, they want to run their schools. And right now you can't. They're being run out of Washington by people that, look, I'm sure some are very good and very caring, but a lot of them are just bureaucrats that want to pick up a check. We want the schools to be run locally. Let me ask you about what has been going on in Charlotte. You saw what happened last yeah. night in North Carolina. Uh, the police did say that the individual was armed, they announced this morning. Um, but you have these high-profile cases. It all started with Obama saying the Cambridge police started uh, acted stupidly. Uh, Trayvon, that could have been me 35 years ago. He'd look like my son. Uh, he weighed in on Ferguson and Michael Brown and Freddie Gray and, and all these high profile race cases. But I just gave a statistic that I think should shock everybody's conscience and soul. I'm in a church pastor. Um, and that is 3,660 people are dead since Obama's been president in his hometown of Chicago. Yeah. I bet there's, I bet nobody knows the names of any of those 3,660. Yeah. Why is yeah. that? Well, the violence in the inner city is incredible. I, in particular, I watched Tulsa. And I know Tulsa. This is uh, the man just happened. Right. Uh, hands up. He was doing everything he was supposed to do. I saw it. Everything. Yeah. And a young policeman shot this man. I don't, I don't get it. I don't, you can come, I don't care where you're coming from, there was something really bad going on. Saw it, he had his hands up. Oh, I don't know if she choked. Yeah. He was walking, his hands were high, he was walking to the car, he put the hands on the car. Now, maybe she choked, something really bad happened. But this is something, uh, you know... How do we stop not, this, just this not cycle of... of violence and more particularly I, I mentioned Chicago 75 percent of those shootings are are black Americans 3,660 since Obama's president yeah. this year alone over 3,000 shot in one city now I would think if it was your home city of New York you would have gone to New York and tried well, to I, I, I was in New York when it was really Bad. numbers never like that I mean Chicago is uh, you you know you take some of these cities it's worse than and there's two Chicago's there's the luxury Chicago where I have this incredible hotel and it's a, a different world and then you have the other side of the world where it's horrible now I have to say the crime is just beyond anything it's worse than Afghanistan you know I said worse than some of the war, war torn cities and you know that's true but in New York, we had Rudy Giuliani did a fantastic job. He was a great mayor. He really was. And we had horrible numbers. And we had a wonderful police commissioner working with Rudy. And they started stop and frisk. And they did a great job. And New York became from one of the more unsafe cities to one of the largest, maybe the largest safe city, I think, right? I think it was the largest safe about city. About 2,500 murders in the year world down to, to 500. Yeah, so it went, it was unbelievable. And it was stop and frisk. Now they've stopped it in New York. Let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. But Chicago, 
maybe more than ever, you're going to need something because what's going on there is absolutely out of control. Let me, let me ask this question. Hillary Clinton has played the race card against you in yeah. this campaign. Yeah. She's talked about, I guess, all of us, if you're supporting Donald Trump, you're a deplorable person, irredeemable. Um, Pastor, I thought everybody was redeemable if you, if you say you're sorry for your sins, right? Okay. Well, and that racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic. She went through the whole list. The whole list. Uh, and check everything off. Um, does that aggravate you? Does that annoy you? Well, you have to know from where it comes. I mean, I understand what's going on. And, uh, I, you know, it's their only hope. They see what's happening with the polls. You see what's happening with the polls. We have a movement going on, John. And this is white, black, Asian, everybody. We have a movement on Hispanic. Um, because people are tired of what's going on in the country. You know, we spent trillions of dollars, six trillion dollars now in the Middle East. And you come to Cleveland or you go to Detroit or Philadelphia and we, we can't build a school. We can't even paint the classrooms. Yeah. We build schools in these places and they knock them down. We build them again. They knock them down. We do it a third time. Look, it is insane. We spent six, we're up to six trillion dollars in the Middle East and our roads have potholes. Our highways are in bad shape. Our bridges are falling down. So, so it's, probably, uh, it's a, uh, people are tired. When of she it. uses all of, all of those names now, she has taken money from countries like the UAE and Kuwait and Oman and, and Saudi Arabia. So she says you're racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, but she takes money from a country that tells where men tell women how to dress, women can't drive, women are told whether they can go to school or work, uh, gays and lesbians are killed for being gay and lesbian, and by the way, they persecute Christians and they persecute Jews. Um, is that hypocrisy? Well, look, everybody understands what's going on there, and it's a whole pay-for-play deal, and a lot of people have been saying it, and for some reason, nobody is picking it up. They're just not picking it up. They don't want to pick it up. They don't like seeing what's happening in the polls. They don't like where we're leading in Florida. We're leading in Ohio. Uh, by the way, the electoral map, according to Reuters, you're, it's 243 to 242. Yeah. That's how close the race is. Coming up, we're just getting started. Donald Trump with us for the entire hour. Coming up next, we'll talk to the Reverend Daryl Scott, Reverend C.L. Bryant, and much more. Also, Don King is in the house. He'll join us straight ahead. And welcome back to Hannity, and we are on the road at the Civic Center. We're in Cleveland Heights, Ohio. That, of course, Pastor Scott, Reverend Pastor Scott, talking about Donald Trump earlier today. He joins us along with radio talk shows, Reverend C.L. Bryant. Don King is here with us as we continue the 2016 Republican presidential candidate, Donald Trump. As I promised, I am turning it over to the audience. Sir, welcome. Thank you for being here. Hey. Thank you. How you doing, Mr. Trump? How are you? Good. My name is Ricardo Sims, and uh, I had a question about... There's been a lot of violence in the black community. I want to know what would you do to help stop that violence, you know, black on black crime. Right. Well, one of the things I'd do, Ricardo, is uh, I would do stop and frisk. I think you have to. We did it in New York. It worked incredibly well. And you have to be proactive. And, you know, you, you really help people sort of change their mind automatically. You understand. You, you have to have, in my opinion, I see what's going on here. I see what's going on in Chicago. I think stop and frisk. In New York City, it was so incredible the way it worked. Now, we had a very good mayor, but New York City was incredible the way that worked. So I think that would be one step you could do. I'll just add one thing to Mr. Trump's comments. The murder rate was around 2,500 a very high percentage of African Americans and it went down below 500 because of the increased police activity in community so it was lives saved every year because of the concern and the resources. Pastor Scott you see the violence I gave the numbers about Chicago how does this end? Well you have to change minds in order to change activity so if we can Mr. Trump has talked about stimulating the economy and providing jobs. I talked to Mr. Trump in Trump Tower about this issue and he told me he believes a major source of crime is unemployment and, and uh, um, lack of income. So if he can solve that job problem and we improve our living conditions, it would cause a change in mind which would cause a change in action. It starts with education. You have talked, explain, I think this education thing is, is not talked about enough. Well, the inner cities are a disaster as far as schools are concerned, education. You know, we build schools all over the Middle East 
and yet we don't build schools for our own children. Uh, the schools in the inner city, the jobs, and, and really what Daryl said is 100%. We don't have, you know, our jobs are being stolen from us. They're going to other countries. And the inner cities are absolutely being devastated in terms of jobs. You can, you, you can speak to some people, 50-year-old men, great people, great men. Uh, I don't know if they're as good as Don King, but they're pretty good, right? <laughs> and, and these are people that had great jobs, and they don't have their job anymore. And the job is moved to Mexico. Their, their factories have moved, their manufacturing's moved to Mexico. And we're not going to let that happen anymore, and we can stop it so easily. So, uh, Pastor Bryant, I, I was a, a paper boy at 8, washed dishes by hand at 12, a cook at 13, a busboy at 14, a waiter at 15, a bartender at, at 17, and then I worked the next seven years in construction, building houses, laying tile, painting, and hanging paper. 55% of black teenagers cannot get a summer job. If I didn't have those jobs, I would have been hanging out with all my dopey friends and getting in a lot of trouble. Right. And you know, Sean, in order to tap into the free market and understand capitalism and of course make the best of what America has to offer, you need an example. And for too many inner city young people, there's no example of how to make money. That's one of the reasons why I think that uh, Mr. Trump will be a perfect president for this present time to African-American youth because he can show the way. What do you think as a pastor, and I'll ask both of you pastors, I'm going to ask Duncan, when they play the race card mm -hmm. and they run Klan ads mm -hmm. against Donald Trump, I can't think of anything more despicable. I, if I remember, Pastor, my, my theology class was right, thou shalt not bear false witness was one of the big ten. <laughs> um, what do you think when you see that? What is well, that? I think that because they can't attack him on policy, they try to make it personal. They appeal to the emotions and the sensitivities of not only the black community, community but the foreigners and females. So they'll say, don't vote for Donald Trump, females, and they'll arouse those emotions. He's a misogynist. He, doesn't, he suppresses and dominates women. Don't vote for him, blacks or uh, uh, Hispanics, because he's a racist. And, and don't for, vote for him, foreigners, because he's a xenophobe. So they attack him and try to make personal, but they don't attack him politically because that's all they have. But the, uh, well, that's a good point. And I will say this. Because this is important. Those statistics, Don King, you have more diamonds on you than anybody I've ever seen. <laughs> I think we got, we got to show that cross there to the pastor. <laughs> that's the biggest one I've ever seen. But Don King, you are an example of an entrepreneur, hardworking, that made money in America not the statistics that I'm reading. What advice can you give and what are you asking Donald Trump to do for the black community? <clears throat> well, what I'm asking Donald Trump to do is what Donald Trump volunteered to do it is to change the system. It doesn't matter about whatever we see, right, wrong, or indifferent. If the system don't change, it's going to be the same. So they say, well, why would make Donald Trump different from Obama or any other president? Because he will call them out. The same as he did with Lindsey Tucker, or what's his name? What's his name? Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham. Mm -hmm. If you say something to him, he's a fighter. Lindsey. He's gonna he's gonna fight back. So what the difference is, he would tell on the people who are up obstreperous that are blocking the change for the progressive of of, uh, of human beings. First of all, for blacks, we got to first be included. We could do all this talk about what you're going to do about jobs, what you're going to do about this. If you ain't included in the system, do not include us. You know, a white woman, they don't include you. You know what I mean? So he got the first, and he's the first one that came up with that. He wants to first create a whole new system, take this system apart, and then create, did put people together to work together, to each one to have a part in it, to be able to make it happen, working collectively together, working together works. Mr. Trump, this is the Diversity Coalition, and we have a diverse audience here tonight. What does it mean? to you to see people of all races and all religions and all backgrounds go on a bat for you in this election the way they are? Well, it means a lot. And Don King is an example. First of all, he's a great entrepreneur. You know, he's the greatest boxing promoter ever, but that's the ultimate entrepreneur. And Don King has been my friend for 25 years. He knows me better than most people know me. That's correct. Say? And 
when he called me, and this wasn't just recently, a long time ago, he endorsed me for president. And I, hate, I shouldn't tell him this, I think he endorsed Bernie Sanders for vice president. Yes. So we what? can't say that. But number one, number two, you're very what? happy with Mike Pence. I have to be. Where's Mike? He's yeah, around here. Mike's here. Uh -huh. well, well, Mike's is an advent because Bernie couldn't stand up. He couldn't give up that party loyalty. But he was the number one and number two vote getters. You were doing great up till now. You really yeah, were. Yeah. It, was the people, it was the people that would be the ones. You know, I look at it like if you when we first started in this yeah. country, the two highest votes would be, the highest would be president, and the second would be vice president. That would be four parties. Right. You know what I mean? The, right. two, the two vote getters would get that. I think America wants success and results. Right. They want they results, want to, and that's tired. what he spells. And they're he tired. Is the, they're, they're he's hurting. the epitome of that. He's the spirit of America. John Paul Jones, you know, being the, when the captain said, do you surrender? Do you surrender? He said, I've not yet begun to fight. <laughs> come and get the British ship, you know what I mean? And went on and navigated himself to the promised land. When we come back, we'll have more questions from our audience President right here Donald in Cleveland Trump. Heights, President Ohio. Plus, Amorosa, Harry Elder, Mike Reynas, they'll join Donald Trump, Donald Trump on stage. That and more as Hannity continues. And welcome back to Hannity, and joining us now we, from the Tea Party forward chairman is Niger Innes, nationally syndicated Salem Radio talk show host Larry Elder, and senior advisor for the African American Outreach for the campaign. She goes by one name, Amarosa. All right, good to see you. Um, and you were great last night, both of you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go back to the audience, as I've been promising. Sir, how are you? Well, thank you for joining us. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Staff Sergeant Corbin Stacey. I'm medically retired or I'm a disabled veteran. Um, with the opiate problem that we're having in this country, with the opiate problem that we're having in this country, I watch my friends get addicted, I watch my superiors get peel chase and all that. But my question is, what is your opinion on the criminal justice system pertaining to the drug sentencing for addicts and for those who sell them? Well, it really starts, it's a huge problem. The drug problem in this country is incredible. It's coming from the southern border, much of it, a real big percentage of it. You know, if you take a place like uh, Ohio and you go to New Hampshire, you go to Pennsylvania, you go to so many of the different places, North Carolina, South Carolina, it's just pouring into our country, all over. I mean, all over. Some states worse than, I mean, New Hampshire has got a problem. It's the number one thing. They don't talk about, that's what they want to solve, is the heroin problem, the problem with drugs. Uh, we have to strengthen our borders. We're going to build a wall. Believe me, the wall's going up. We have to strengthen. The drugs are gone. The drugs are coming in. They are poisoning our country. Not only our youth. You know, we always say youth. Well, the youth is being poisoned, but the whole country. I mean, it's horrible. Men, women, 50 years old, 70 years old. I've never seen anything like it. The drugs are pouring across the border. It's like water. And we're going to solve that problem. We have to also help the people that are addicted. We have so many people already addicted. We have to help them. You know, I... It's a great I, question. I was down to the border 12 times, all the way from the Rio Grande to San Diego. I was in helicopter, boats, all-terrain vehicle, horseback, believe it or not. And I went into a drug warehouse, bigger than this room times 10, floor to ceiling drugs. Big problem in every community in America now, especially this heroin epidemic. Mm -hmm. Niger, uh, I know you've talked about it. How do we, if we build the wall, isn't that going to prevent a lot of those drugs from coming in? It's not only uh, building the wall, which needs to be done, but it's a question of leadership. You and I, Mr. Trump, were in New York in the early 90s, and when Rudy Giuliani came in, he created a revolution in New York that reduced crime, homelessness, and the crisis. But he was attacked, remember, he was attacked for being a racist because he went into the communities where the crimes were taking place, and lo and behold, people's lives were saved. Absolutely, and I have no doubt that Mr. Trump is going to do for the United States of America what Rudy did for New York. Larry, um... You're the sage from South Central. <laughs> you and me, Niger, we've been friends a, a long time. Right. Both of you as friends have taken a lot of heat for being black Americans and conservative. But historically, the black vote goes to the Democratic Party. Why? The Democratic Party has convinced black people that they're victims, that they're perpetual victims. And those guys over there, Tea Party Republicans, black Republicans, uh, Republicans in general, are, are the villains. And we wear the white hat, they wear the black hat. That's what they've done. The number one problem facing the black community is the absence of fathers in the home. Almost. Uh, 
you know, you know I've, been doing, I've been doing radio for about 25 years, and I'm, 25 years I've asked Reverend Jesse Jackson to come on my show about 50 times. He won't do it. Sharpton about 50 times. He won't do it. I've asked Farrakhan several times. The one black leader who did come on my show was Kwesi Infume when he was head of the NAACP. My first question was, Mr. Infume, as between the presence of white racism or the absence of black fathers, which poses the bigger threat to the black community? Without missing a beat, he said, the absence of black fathers. Mm. Rosa, you have emerged as one of Mr. Trump's most ardent supporters. Didn't he fire you? Yes. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> Barely. Barely. Once Barely. or twice? Yeah. Three times. <laughs> but I'm the only one Who's that counting? did three seasons That's of The true. Apprentice. And I need to know that he also produced a show for me on... TV One, an African-American owned network, and not a lot of people know that. So he actually invested in me as a talent and in my vision. You know, but and she did a great job. <laughs> you don't ever tell the story. I, look, I've known you for decades now, and I've been to Trump Towers many, many times. There is nothing but diversity working for you. Absolutely. I see it in myself. I witnessed it myself. And then I watch these attacks against you. If it was me, I think I'd be pretty ticked off. Well, you know, the one thing I see is that when you start to win, and I've watched this not just for me, I've watched it over the years, when you start to win and win and win oh, yeah. and they have nothing to say and they can't stop you, they always start using the racist word. And it's a very interesting phenomenon, but the word racist comes out and that means that you're winning and that's their last chance. And I don't think it's working. Yeah. Can I point out... Yeah. We have a huge diversity coalition called the National Diversity Coalition, founded by Michael Cohen, Daryl Scott, Bruce Lavelle is here. Can I have those members of the National Diversity Coalition to stand Absolutely. up? Do you mind? Exactly. Will the members of the National Diversity Coalition please stand up? Thank you, Scott. All races, all background, all religion. Mm -hmm. I mean, we see it. Been with us from the beginning, Sean. From the beginning, and one of the first meetings that we set up in Trump Tower was with a hundred African American ministers. This was last year. No one notes that. No one takes notice that the first thing that we did was to get him in front of faith leaders so that he could have a real dialogue and share his vision for this country. Isn't it? Don't you think? And you said this. I, I watched your Saturday morning speech in Detroit, and I went on the air the next Monday, and I said I thought that was the best speech you gave. It was beautiful. And you talked about. And what you said, first of all, I was glad to see you there, predominantly black church. And what you said is the backbone of this country was built in America's churches and specifically black churches. It's true. That's true. And that's a fact. And I saw such love in that room. That was an amazing morning for me. Uh, that was Bishop Jackson. Right. What an amazing guy he is, and his family, his wife, who's really such a, an important part of the church. The, the church was, I mean, packed. Just, you know, a thousand... A typical day in the life of Trump, everything. Yeah, no, no, this, this church was packed. I guess uh, at least, I, I mean, well over a thousand people, Absolutely. you were there. And it was really a beautiful thing. And the song and the love and the, you know, the, the feeling in that room was incredible. And I got up and made a speech, and you really feel it from the heart. That was an amazing group of people, and I'll tell you what, he's an amazing, he's Bishop Jackson. I did an interview with him, and so many people saw that interview. So many people told me about that, but it was a really great morning. We'll take a break. We'll come back. When we come back, Dr. Benjamin Carson, his wife Candy, they will join us that and more as we continue Hannity on the Road with Donald Trump from Cleveland Heights, Ohio. I will. That was Donald Trump speaking to pastors earlier today right here in Cleveland Heights, Ohio. Joining us now, along with Donald Trump, is Dr. Benjamin Carson, his wife Candy. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to be back. You were one of the first Republican candidates, one of the 17. He kind of beat up a lot of people uh, in that primary uh, to support him. And I just talked to you earlier tonight. You're, you're like passionate. You want him to be president. Yes. Well... He's a very good man. There's a, a lot of things that people don't know about him. But one of the things that I noticed when I was running, um, for instance, during the, uh, the debate when we had the moment when I couldn't hear my name, yeah. everybody else walked by. He stood there with me. I remember that. Uh, and, and then there was another time. Another time, you know, he was chastising the media because 
they wouldn't ask me any questions. The moderators wouldn't ask. They kept trying to skip over me. He was the only one who said anything. The rest of them were perfectly happy with it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he, he and, and I was the competition. So yeah. it tells you that he does have some, a lot more integrity than the other people did. But uh, also, you know, I wasn't particularly anxious to run for president, to be honest with you. But I did it because there was so many people clamoring for it. I had thousands, hundreds of thousands of petitions, and I said, I can't turn my back on the American people. But I was secretly hoping that there was somebody who had the same kinds of values and principles who would withstand the, the terrible corruption that is throughout our system. Let me ask you this. With your background as a brain surgeon, the, <laughs> a real brain sir. The, since Obama's been president, remember he promised you keep your doctor, you keep your plan. On average, the average family will save $2,500 per family per year. Well, since Obama's been president, average family is paying $4,100 more for health care. Right. If Mr. Trump came to you and said, Dr. Carson, I want you to help me repeal and replace Obamacare with free market competition or health savings accounts, what would you say? I would say I and a lot of people that I know say and yes. are associated with will be very happy to help do that. <laughs> good to see you and good to see you as well. And by the way, these guys hosted my radio show one day together as a team. <laughs> And everyone called in and said, we want them, not you. Uh, all right, we'll take a break. Thank you both. When we come back, our last segment, Governor Mike Pence will join us on stage as we continue with Donald Trump from Ohio. And welcome back to Hannity. And joining us now is Donald Trump's running mate, Indiana Governor Mike Pence, as we continue with the Republican presidential nominee. I think Hillary didn't have a rally for 19 days in August. I hear she's off again today, um, prepping, I guess, for the debate. Five days from now, you will be debating Hillary Clinton. I will. That's right. And you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I'm here. I, I'm going to ask this in front of Mike Pence. Don't you think her whole strategy is to get him annoyed and mad? Uh, I, I, you know, I don't know what her strategy is. She certainly I, can't I can run on you, a record. I can tell you the contrast between uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, who has a has a career uh, of dishonesty, probably the most dishonest candidate for president in history, and this bold truth teller is going to be dramatic. And I'm I'm very very confident the American people are going to see that Donald Trump is the right man at the right time to make America great again. But, Governor, you heard the numbers that I gave at the beginning of the show, unemployment numbers, labor participation, home ownership rate, 12 million more Americans on food stamps, 8 million more in poverty, right. doubling of the debt. The people here tonight and at home, they want to know that their lives are going to change for the better and opportunity is coming back. Well, How I, do you tell them? Well, I, I said today at, at, the, uh, at the church gathering where we were before, uh, this is a broad-shouldered leader, but he's also a man that's in patient with failure. He's impatient with failing leadership and failing policies. And I think the American people are learning more and more every day. When he talks about making America great again, that's for every American, regardless of race or creed or color or gender. That's an inclusive message. And that's why it's resonating all over the Donald country. Trump, last word. You were invited into this church. You have made outreach to the black community, Hispanic community, paramount in your campaign. What is the last word you want to tell them? Well, I'm just very honored by how well we're doing with the Hispanic community and the African-American community. I want to thank Daryl and all of the people here in Cleveland. It's been incredible. Uh, it's been an incredible day. And I think, we're, I think we're really doing a job. You look at the inner cities, you look at what's going on, how they just, just, they're not being helped. They're not being helped. And we're going to help them. We're going to fix it. We're going to really make life better for people. And that's so important. Ronald Reagan asked, are you better off than you were eight years ago. I'll ask this audience, are you better off than where you were eight years ago? No. Answers the question. Yes, Mr. Is. Trump, thank you for being thank with us. Thank Governor you, Pence, thank you. All right, that's all the time we have left this evening. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Daryl Scott. We appreciate it, Reverend. And thanks all of you.